This is your home for St. Cloud State Hockey, keeping you up to date on the NCHC. One-timer, come in, they score! Ripped in! A bomb from Perrix! Women's WCHA. So Dana Rasmussen fires and she scores! Dana Rasmussen for the Huskies. The National Hockey League. Dwayne Kaprizov in for a chance to win it! He scores! And everything from the state of hockey. St. Cloud Cathedral is now 42.6 seconds away from wrapping up the school's first ever title. Welcome to the Huskies Warming House Podcast Den. Welcome into the Huskies Warming House podcast, episode 164 here in the den. Nick Max and Noah Grant here with this week's episode. Uh, at the tail end of May here, we're moving into the almost the heart of summer-ish. I don't really know that we, we get about three weeks of hot weather followed by about nine months of blizzard. So does it really translate well? I uh, Well, I think this year, especially here, in, at least in Minnesota, the, the spring was non-existent again for the second year in a row. So it's we, we had literally what last week week and a half finally some warm weather it's getting <laughs> green around but i mean before then there's not that transition time right so it's almost you know sort of surreal that we're here and before you know it it's going to be gone again that's the <laughs> that's the worst <laughs> yeah. part about it it's, you know it's so quick. you know it's interesting i so i was talking with my girlfriend today who of course is moving here in less than a month back you know to the to the contiguous 48 states uh but she's up in alaska and um, I was busy working on stuff today. And of course we were FaceTiming and, and she goes, yeah, it just snowed two hours South of here. And, you know, I, I didn't think much of it. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I wonder how much snow they got or whatever. And she goes, Noah, it's May 30th. I'm like, oh yeah, maybe that is a little bit weird. I like heard the word Alaska. And <laughs> I mean, I, it's probably in the mountain ranges. I mean, it, like if you would have said there was a grizzly bear in a snowmobile, I mean, is that out of the ordinary for that region? You know what I mean? Like no. it's, from all of those things that have come out of Alaska, that's right about on par with the news cycle up there. So, As long as the sea wolves have funding, I'm all for whatever it is. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> with that being said, though, of course, we're going to round out the rest of the NCAA and talk about some player moves. Actually, quite a bit on the men's and women's side. A little bit of St. Cloud State tidbit as well, too, that we'll throw in there in the early portions of the main portion of the show, I should say. Of course, NHL playoffs, the Stanley Cup final is prime, set, ready, uh, and on the table, Florida and Vegas getting ready to do battle uh, at the tail end of this week. The Minnesota Wild have news related to their farm system. Uh, the Iowa Wild naming their head coach, meaning a vacancy is also available at the NHL level. We'll, we'll dive into that and kind of what that means, as well as maybe take a little quick look at the AHL. The Calder Cup playoffs are uh, approaching their finals as well, too. Or the Hershey Bears are a wagon. Let's just put it that way. Uh, so and, an too, to a degree. Holy yeah. Um, and then in the World Cup, uh, the United States doing exactly what they do on the international stage, which is not good things, apparently. Um, know, at least. <laughs> I guess not. So we're going to talk about that. And then our extra ice session will circle back all the way around to St. Cloud State and the actual university. If you haven't been following along, well, we'll get you up to speed here. It's been tumultuous. interesting. Yeah. yeah. That does, when is it not tumultuous? Can we just say... St. Cloud got X amount of dollars in funding and life is kosher at the end. Can we just have a story like that? Just, just for a little bit, just hasn't happened in 10 years. It ain't going to happen anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> well, before we age 10 years ourselves, let's head on over to the Huskies Illustrated Weekly Roundup and Center Ice View News and Notes. Center Ice View News and Notes. Center Ice View provides you with the best coverage of St. Cloud State Huskies hockey from game notes, recaps, photos, and more. Go to centericeview.com. Illustrated Weekly Roundup here, Noah. And as you mentioned, uh, some news around the NHL, the American Hockey League, uh, some coaches and some player movement, right? Uh, yeah. This one, uh, how about this? Uh, so the Capitals, uh, 
parted ways with Peter Laviolette have named Spencer Carberry as a their new head coach on a four-year deal. Uh, Carberry spent the last two seasons as an assistant coach with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, he ran the power play, which ranked second in the National Hockey League, 26.6% over that span. He's the youngest active head coach at 41 years of age. Uh, before he went to the Toronto Maple Leafs organization, he led the Caps AHL affiliate in Hershey. Uh, we're going to talk about Hershey a little bit later, too. They're good as far as the uh, AHL Calder Cup playoffs are concerned. Um, also played the final two years of his career um, with the Capitals ECHL affiliate back in 2010. So former player. Uh, but this one's a bit interesting. No one I mentioned that because there's still... With Toronto, a lot of uncertainty after the departure of Kyle Dubas. And what about Sheldon Keefe, right? And this was a name I'm pretty confident was had been thrown around, I, I know for sure, in the Canadian media about if Sheldon Keefe was not renewed by whoever GM or even Brandon Shanahan uh, to be the head coach. This was a guy that a lot of people had their eyes tied on. And now he's with another organization. So, uh, holy cow, does this change things for Toronto and number one and how about number two congrats to him getting his first head coaching job it's it's nice to see a new name getting an opportunity there because there's so often we see the same names that are recycled and i'm not saying that they haven't earned those opportunities but at some point you like to see new blood getting a chance at a head coaching spot yeah and obviously has experience with that same organization you know at the minor league level and a head coaching gig as well too and i think the thing that uh you look at with toronto is that you know they're still going they're still going through it as the kids would say um but washington had the job available and he has familiarity with the organization both as a player and as a coach uh, you know multiple times going through that organization this is actually his third trip back on the administrative coaching side uh, back to this organization in, in some capacity. So I, I suppose it makes sense, right? It's not like he's headed to Anaheim or whatever it is. I mean, there's a lot of familiarity, a lot of uh, known commodity with uh, Carberry going back here. So yeah, it's a great opportunity. The Capitals desperately need kind of a revamp here. It's odd that, yeah. you know, Hershey is so good and the Caps this year were anything but. So uh, it'll be an interesting transition to see how they adjust their game. And it's interesting too, because you have the Alex, you know, Ovechkin, kind of nuance right which is he's definitely in the twilight years of his career he's chasing uh the ultimate you know record that nobody thought could be broken and he still could very well meet or break it uh the next couple of seasons and it's it's hard to really it's kind of what pittsburgh has done in the past right where it's you know it's malkin it's uh it's latang it's crosby just to name a couple right where there's some key veterans that just you're just synonymous together with the team right and i just don't think that Washington is in that spot yet to really make some major changes. And you just kind of, like you said, hope a new coach comes in and can, you know, maybe tweak a couple of things and uh, can get a little bit more success out of that organization and that roster. Um, Speaking of which, uh, the Nashville Predators are trying to do the same thing. And for a guy that I've uh, known a little bit, had a pleasure of interviewing a couple of times. How about Andrew Brunette, uh, the New Jersey Devils assistant from this last year, technically associate head coach, um, not sure I know the difference, but actually I do. But, you know, um, spent uh, also some time as an associate head coach under Joel Quinville and then took over as head coach of Florida when they won the President's Trophy last year, right? Um, was a Jack Adams Award finalist. Um, so uh, how about that, right? Uh, Brunette has essentially taken over Florida, went 51-18-6, and six, uh, does not get essentially the earned term tag removed goes to New Jersey under Lindy Ruff as an associate head coach. There, are now finally gets an opportunity with the predators and now Barry Trotz, the new GM. Uh, I'm not sure if this was Trotz or David Poyle that did not renew John Hines in his contract, but neither, neither less uh, Andrew Burnett getting an opportunity here. And how about this? He actually played for Nashville in 98, 99, which I believe was the first year that they were in the national hockey league. And uh, supposedly scored the franchises, first ever NHL goal. So cool well, to see an opportunity. Well, so. not supposedly he did, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, a, yeah. And then of course, part of that expansion draft, not too long after, you know, for Minnesota as well too, uh, you know, coming over to the wild a couple of years after. So um, yeah, but John Hines, I mean, no real playoff success for him, for that organization, just never really gained any traction with the predators. Um, certainly kind of need a, a recycle and a retool. The Predators are a weird team because they rose to prominence in the mid 2010s, made all that noise, and then they're just kind of there. And I, you know, and I say that as a Minnesota Wild fan where everyone else thinks that we're just kind of there and maybe we are. Um, 
but it kind of has some we are i need to blow everything up but you know it it kind of has that feel to it though does it not like it's just the the, like the the predators are the predators aren't bad but they're just not relevant right now well here's the difference right they was it 2016 that they made the cup finals 2017 i get those two mixed up every single time um but after that right they never really seemed to have the ability to repeat a deep run right and Here's the difference. You talk about the Nashville Predators, and uh, they're loaded as as far as trying to retool this team. Two first-round picks this year. They're on plus uh, Edmonton's first. They've got two second-round picks, three-thirds, three-fourths, two-fifths, a sixth. They don't have a seventh, but I don't think anybody cares about that. Um, you can see that the Predators are in a prime position, and if you're Barry Trotz, right, inheriting an organization that you spent so long at the home as a head coach, right? Taking over from David Poyle, one of the longest tenure GMs, if not the longest genu- uh, tenure GM in the NHL prior to his departure sometime this summer. Um, you're going to have a lot of tools at your disposal to, uh, you know, build for the future, make some tweaks. Now, if you see, you know, whether you take some of that draft catapult and make it a trade um, or you have a deep draft and you decide, you know what, we're going to go all in and I'm just on a future and see what happens. But, it is interesting because, like you said, you know, beyond that Stanley Cup run, they've had, you know, they've been a playoff sort of team, but they really have never been that dangerous, true cup contender feel to them since then. Yeah. And, you know, unlike the San Jose Sharks, I think Nashville finally this year realized that they needed to retool. They needed to rebuild per se, or maybe, you know, on the fly. And instead of trying to prolong things, um, again, we saw with Matias at home being traded at the deadline, uh, not re-upping Connor Ingram, which was kind of a surprise before this last off season. I think there were some indications there that even they knew that even if they kept some of those pieces around, they're just, wasn't enough really there to make a full push. And so you got to credit Nashville, you know, to really sort of embrace where they're at and to know that, okay, here's a fresh blood, Barry Trotz. You got some draft capital build. Let's build, rebuild this from the ground up a little bit and see what we can get from it. Because when it's time, it's time. And again, if you, if you put, if you prolong it, it just makes that rebuild even longer and more painful. Yeah, and the goal is to get where these three guys are. Jim Nill, Don Sweeney, Bill Zito, uh, finalist for the Jim Gregory General Manager of the Year Award. Um, And this award, I I, I say this as a caveat, um, voted on by the other GMs, obviously, in a panel of NHL executives uh, after the second round of the cup playoffs. But it's for the GM who best excelled at their role during the regular season. So I say that with the caveat. There's two of these guys that definitely deserve to be here. Not saying the third doesn't, but I think there's definitely some influence postseason wise bill zito probably shouldn't be in this argument with florida even with I the great i don't agree with that well what okay the great moves with matthew kachuk i know that's where we're going because we're talking about the offseason before that set this team up but you can't deny the fact that for 85 percent of the season the panthers were a mediocre team that scraped into the playoffs and like i said not saying he's not a great honorable mention clearly The Panthers have done well in the postseason. Clearly, the offseason was successful in terms of getting guys like Kachuk that were going to make a difference. But, I mean, come on. You're not going to throw Bill Guerin in there instead for what he did underneath the dead cap that he's been working with to get Minnesota into the first round in a a deep first round. Like, that, you know what I mean? Like, no, and and you know what? It's funny because we – you, you you made the point that I don't think we talk about enough. And I think we've tried on the show a couple of times as to, you know, how, you know, handcuffed the wild organization is mm-hmm. and the fact that they're even in the conversation for playoffs. Yeah, it's about to get worse. Yeah. 13 now, almost 14 now, sorry, $15 million the next couple mm-hmm. of seasons with literally no cap help. And then the pandemic, they derailed, an L, you know, a, a cap that was rising. Right. So you think about that, that they probably did that initially thinking, okay, it will hurt. But as the cap rises, it maybe alleviates some of that pain per se, but then you get a pandemic, you get a flat cap situation it's exacerbated it, and you can't plan for that. But no, think about this with Bill Zito and I'm not disagreeing with your point, but I will say this. There are some GMs that sometimes overdo it. And what I mean by that is, when you go out and you trade for Matthew Kachuk and you make some of these other moves, I think as a GM, right, you look at the construction of a team and you you have to be confident, okay, this this can work. And even though the team struggles, and they struggled, right? You talk about teams that underperformed in the regular season. The Florida Panthers were the limelight of that, right? There were talks of how 
this could have been like the biggest failure of a season, the first team ever to win a president's trophy the previous season and then not even make the postseason the next. That was there. I'm not denying that. But very easily the trade deadline. You could have, if you're Bill Zito, panicked. You could have made some moves to try to re-energize it. He didn't do that. He, I don't even know if he even made a tweak. He just simply said, hey, you know what? These guys got to figure it out. And sometimes less is more. And I think, you know, for you, if you're the GM, you, your job is to construct it. You know, was there coaching involved in that time too? Paul Maurice, first year head coach under Florida. So is it the GM or the coaching, right? And I'm not sure what the answer to that is. But I do think you have to give credence to a GM who doesn't overreact in a situation like that too. Um, Don Sweeney of, of, Boston, of Boston, sure, right? Yeah. Great moves. That team was an absolute wagon. You 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 fail yeah. to make the top final. I'm I'm not sure that that at least to me right that that, but you also had a lot of pieces there to be a cup contender first. You know you have a lot of returning pieces. Yes, you made some smart acquisitions yeah. at the deadline, including some three way trades. You know mm-hmm. that uh, alleviated that cat space and were able to get it. Oh geez, I think was it the the Dimitri Orlov trade was probably the best one that he made. Super good fit on the Boston. Bruins. Well, yeah, you know, I, I think what I go back to, I mean, obviously Zito, of course, uh, hiring Paul Maurice, of course, and then Matthew Kachuk. But then after that, his other signings, Nick Cousins, Eric Stahl, Colin White and Mark Stahl. I mean, that's those are his four yeah. moves. Uh, Sweeney, like you mentioned, Tyler Bertuzzi, Garnet Hathaway and Dimitri Orlov. I like just three guys that uh, what great moves. And then Evgeny Dadnov and Max Domi ahead of the trade deadline for Dallas and Jim Nil as well, too. Like I said, I don't I don't disagree that Jim Nil, you know, obvious or not Jim Nil, Bill Zito had a good season. But I think Jim Nil and Don Sweeney were just kind of in another tier, I think, in just uh, in this comparison, because um, we're talking we're talking about the regular season. And it's right, like, but let me throw you a caveat here. And this is why is. You can argue Boston had the best season, but remember when GMs make moves, it's not just about the immediate impact, but what's what's the next, right? What's the ripple effect? Mind you, Trent Frederick, Patrice Bergeron, Tyler Bertuzzi, Nick Foligno, Garnett Hathaway, David Krejci, Thomas Noshek, all free agents, right? The only one that's an RFA is Trent Frederick, right? Yeah. So uh, Connor Clifton, Dimitri Arloff, also UFAs. So... And you don't come away even with a series win. So, and, and why that to me is important is because, okay, Pasternak, again, he's getting paid pretty good money. Uh, the, the Bruins don't have a first round pick in, for two years. They also don't have a second round pick for three years, as it stands right now. I know trades can happen. So, is it really that good? When you yeah, but the award the, the award is talking about this season's regular season. Right. In my and, argument, and, is, and so that's yeah. Minus playoff success. I don't even care about playoffs. The fact that Don Sweeney took a team that was already a wagon, already a wagon, and made three more moves underneath the cap strap that they already had and didn't hurdle that team into oblivion, a la Chuck Fletcher, Martin Hounsel a couple years ago. I would argue that he kind of did. I would the argue Bruins, that he the Bruins, did. The Bruins were one shot away, and also – uh. Um, Brad Marchand breakaway on Sergei Bobrovsky that got robbed at the end of regulation away from moving on to the second round. Like, it's not like they've rolled over and died. I mean, Again, they, minus the postseason, you said the postseason doesn't matter. I'm telling you that the moves with the picks that they traded away with all the guys that are uh, free agents and their cap sa- space situation, decent, you know, of was it, uh, I think 22 million, but it's not. Have- but it doesn't take into consideration what happens after the playoffs, setting your team up forward. It's just all about how did they do in the regular season. And for me, I think Don Sweeney, most GMs would be terrified having an already exceptional team to pull the trigger on more guys and really kind of disrupt that roster with three really key additions, guys that are regulars in the NHL lineup right. to make that move. I just, I think I it, take, it takes balls. I mean, like, like let's just put it out I there. Don't, you know? I don't disagree yeah. with, with its gutsy, but I think you also have to understand too that I think I think the way that Don Sweeney played it is okay. This is our one trigger we're going to pull because again, if you if you just take the names that I listed and the players that are not coming back, the same players they traded for, right? And with all the picks that they do not have in a deep draft, right? Not to say you can't recoup those, but you're not going to trade away assets. You don't have anything to get first round capital back. Is to me the regular season this matters because. You it's and it's not just about the playoff success, but it's like even if you went on to win the cup, 
I would argue that you still didn't really do much here because now it's still in pieces for the next couple of seasons. So I don't know. It's 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 opinion based. Look, I'm not as, seeing as long I, as a Dallas star doesn't win. I, I could care right. less. So, right? like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> like it, it takes like I said, I'm with you. It takes guts. But I, I just I hesitate in the fact that the Boston Bruins are going to be feeling the effects of this regular season and the moves that they made for years to come. And it's no, not I don't. I don't disagree. It, it it's just not doesn't feel as good because you don't even get out. Of no, the I don't disagree. I'm just saying that doesn't have any bearing on how you interpret the award. It's not oh the regular season and how did they set their team up. It's how did they do during the regular season? The end. Like but yeah, that's how we have always kind of clammed at yeah. Chuck Fletcher, right? Is you know he he over traded. You know the Marty Hansel Ryan White trade where he didn't really need to make it. Oh, but then you could say was that a gutsy trade or whatnot? Because you know he thought that you needed some extra depth in the lineup. You know it, it's open to the interpretation, but to me it's at least maybe just how I think of it, and maybe that's just my dumbass brain. I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, at the end of the day, like to me, I, I do think that that weighs on me a little bit just because I, I just think in today's NHL, you can't you can't prep a team and you can't make the moves for a one shot. You just you just can't. Well, the, Bru- the Bruins had no choice, though. I mean, they have so many guys that are not going to be. I mean, Patrice Bergeron might not even be there next year, you know, so I mean, it's so I guess if if we're, if the Boston Bruins were in a unique situation, which I would agree that they were, yeah, then. Okay, but still, like the fallout from this, I still think is no. Little, I don't. Dis- I don't disagree. You know, I don't, it's yeah. it's it's a tough. It's tough. We'll put it that way. It's tough. I just I don't know. I think could be worse. You, could be Toronto. You, you <laughs> it, they both are kind of different, right? Because you have Zito that stayed pat and decided no, this team is is fine, and then you have Don Sweeney that says no, I want more. You know, he's just got that. Yeah. You know, you know, it's like no, like this is cookie a good, monster hungry. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and. <laughs> it's funny how hockey works sometimes. And again, bounces here and there. Right. But I don't know, like to me tough. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not really sure either. Uh, speaking of uh, GM moves, by the way, it sounds like the Pittsburgh Penguins are closing in on, on Kyle Dubas here from what I wouldn't, wouldn't be shocked if we see something in the next week or two, potentially with that, it's not confirmed, not done deal, but a lot of rumblings sound like we're inching closer to this. And we've been on this path with Pittsburgh for a while, actually. So um, c- kind of interesting. Uh, the Sabres also inking a uh, former Golden Goal for Kyle Oposo, one-year $2.5 million deal. He's 35 right now, had 28 points in 75 contests uh, last season. So that wraps up uh, the Huskies Illustrated Weekly Roundup. We have no injuries of note as we head into the Stanley Cup Final. And welcome into the main portion of the show. Noah Grant, Nick Maxson here in the Huskies Warming House podcast den for episode 164. We welcome you in on Wednesday or later whenever you are listening to us here. Of course, we'll probably be releasing around the same time, maybe a little bit earlier in the week, potentially uh, next week, depending on how things shake out. We'll probably only have likely the first two games of the Stanley Cup final under our belt by the time we meet next. So uh, this series, the scheduling is might be a little bit lengthy, might take potentially three weeks if it goes deep uh, to finish the Stanley Cup final. So keep an eye on that one, of course. Uh, we start, of course, with NCAA player moves, though, Nick, uh, and quite a bit going on here. Uh, on the men's side, we'll start with a little bit of rumblings for St. Cloud State a little bit here. I uh, got a chance to talk to some sources that were pretty close to uh, the Fargo Force organization and talking about uh, how Werner Mietnan probably has intentions to sign as NLI, potentially heading to St. Cloud next season. So uh, that's really exciting news. Would love to see him, uh, if he does do that, play with his brother, uh, potentially maybe even on the same line. I think that would be uh, an awesome addition. And then on the other side, we've been keeping an eye on that defensive core that has about five guys for sure right now for St. Cloud. Uh, conversations that Leo Gruba may intend to stay in Fargo in the USHL for another season uh, uh, and kind of get some seasoning there as well, too. So some St. Cloud news. Uh, any kind of reaction if these are indeed on the table? It's. I don't think it's too surprising. Again, Werner's name has been rumored for a while to go play with his brother, at least for a season. Now, um, VD could elect a fifth year. Um, he is part of that last COVID group. So there's potential for two seasons with his brother. Um, see how Brett Larson plays it. I think we did ask him directly, would they play in the same line? And uh, in true Brett Larson fashion, well, you know, was uh, hesitant to say for sure. I'm sure he'll try it. And there's no question about it. Uh, but Leo Gruba, that's, 
you know, that's not as surprising, you know, to me. Uh, I know for some people there's there's a lot of hype around his game and there's plenty of reason for it. But you kind of wonder too, you know, from his perspective, right? Whereas, you know, St. Cloud traditionally has liked some of the more seasoned players. So that's one. Two, maybe he sees the depth chart and maybe he just says, you know, I want to be an impact player and maybe another year wouldn't hurt. And yeah, you, you know, wonder, you wonder if like, does Dylan Anhorn change things? You know, like you, you, you wonder, right. Yeah. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only, uh, but, you know, the only thing that could derail, that would be, you know, a serious injury or whatnot. And there's always a risk at, at any level, right. Dylan Anhorn speaking of. Um, so if that is indeed true, both on uh, Miatnan and on Gruba, um, I'm not too shocked there. Um, but again, uh, from what, you sound like it sounds like that's you know not confirmed, but sort of is the the rumblings that we're hearing, and that wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, confidence factor is moving up on that one for sure. I think uh, also the Huskies having confidence in the fact that regardless of if it would have been this season or next year for Gruba, they're getting a great talent on the back end, mm-hmm. a guy that's going to move well into the Division One realm, so should be exciting. Uh, other men's news here: uh, Teddy Langerback uh, from Arizona State to Miami, uh, seven points in thirty games as a freshman this season. So. Uh, he's another addition for the Red Hawks. Uh, Logan Britt headed to North Dakota from Sacred Heart also was a Quinnipiac product before uh, senior defenseman had 12 points in 37 games for Sacred Heart last season. So UND desperately searching for uh, any sort of defensive depth, obviously. Uh, and then Western Michigan, Ethan Phillips uh, headed to the Broncos from Boston University had 11 points in his senior forward season. He's a Detroit draft pick. So probably just a depth piece there uh, for Pat Fershweiler's club over there uh, in the great state of Michigan. Uh, on the women's side here, uh, we have, uh, let's see, four moves here, two of them involving our friends at Ohio State, Nick. Um, oh, they've been quiet for a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm probably going to butcher this name. I'm going to do my best. I think it's Solvig Nunzert, uh, junior defenseman, is headed to Minnesota from Princeton, had four points in 31 games played, but was a Swedish national team participant, has been in the portal since around February. So a, a bit of a late acquisition for Minnesota. I don't know much about her game. Point value suggests probably a defensive defenseman, if I had to guess. Um, Minnesota has kind of been in an interesting spot this offseason. Does it not feel like where yeah. they, they've lost a couple of bodies, they've tried to recuperate with a couple of players that um, are maybe a little bit different brand from what we've seen? And they chose elsewhere. From, though, from Brad right? Frost, yeah. Um yeah, it's, it's weird. weird. This Gophers team, I don't know. Here's the thing, though. Uh, when you got Brad Frost at the helm, you can never count this team out. Um, you know, and you kind of wonder, too, if, you know, for, for the Gophers, you know, when you're looking at teams like Wisconsin, Duluth, Ohio State, which are recruiting very well right now, you, you kind of wonder, too, you know, because it's not just the coaches, right? It's, it's, you know, the other girls that, you know, watch this. And sometimes it's, you know, the hot, the hot new toy, right? Which is okay. Uh, I know that, you know, that lady on that school that played really well, she's going to Ohio state. I'm in the transfer portal. Hell, let's go over there. Let's make this a super team. Right. Right. Uh, That does happen. Not saying that it, it, it does for sure, but um, you kind of wonder if that just isn't what Minnesota is facing. That is, you know, every, you know, again, Ohio state, Holy cow. Have they, added uh duluth is also added uh wisconsin has always been a perennial program despite the fact that they um shall we say were sort of not the most prominent regular season program but again showed that they can show up um when it matters during the playoff run and then you have minnesota right so and minnesota does have the legacy of being a good program but you just I know some years are different. This one just kind of feels that way where they're just not the top destination for either the top recruits or the top players that have entered the transfer portal. But again, they're still going to be up there and we'll just see what happens. Yeah, there is one destination we're going to get to that apparently seems like the place to be. Uh, I can't remember this quick one here. I can't remember if we mentioned that Claire Vekic ended up at Mankato from Bemidji. Seven points as a sophomore forward last year. So I couldn't remember if we mentioned or not. So I want to throw it in there again. So double dose if so. Uh, But Ohio State, uh, Jamie Grinder is leaving Ohio State for Maine. Had two points as a sophomore defenseman. Making room for, oh, why not? A Team USA player in Kayla Barnes. Boston College, uh, 19 points in 36 games as a senior defenseman. Why not? Jeez. Why not just add to it? (laughs) 
what was it when we when we looked at at the time? It was it was probably a month ago, right? When they added like two hundred and some points during yeah. you know the current transfer, but now that number is probably closer to two fifty, maybe even three hundred. Like, I mean, just, what's another nineteen points from the back end? Why not? So you know what's going to happen because this is how hockey works. You 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 get all these. It seems to be offensively talented people. And yeah. you're going to fall flat on your face and some type of weird defensive game in the first round of the NCAAs. And that's just how hockey works. It'll, yeah. I, I don't hope that to happen. Is, is Don Sweeney the GM? I don't. <sighs> luckily, <laughs> luckily uh, Don Sweeney does not have um, any influence on NCAA. <laughs> as long as it's not Chuck Fletcher, right? Uh, no, well, geez. no first round picks to give away. He doesn't want any part of that. So. Well, those are two teams who would love to be where our next teams are. The Stanley Cup final is set. Uh, holy crap, what an ass kicking from Vegas against Dallas the other night. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Felt like, and you know, it's interesting, right? Because you're up 3 nothing in the series. You win, too. So you actually are getting momentum back. You're actually starting to move the pressure from yourself over to Vegas, right? Don't, don't tell them that. <laughs> well, and, and then because I think two things can be true here. I think Vegas decided, OK, we cannot let enough this is enough. Yeah. Enough is enough. And Dallas, you must kind of wonder, too, did they put too much pressure on themselves at home? Right. Because it like from the drop of the puck, it seemed like just Vegas was there was one way that they were going to walk out of that building. That is winning. Yeah, you could tell right away. You could yeah. tell. And I know there's been a lot of talk about Jake Ottinger. I don't know how much you fault him for the last couple of games. I mean, they put 17 shots on him in the first. Like, yeah. Uh, and at the end of the day, the shots that go in, you know, nobody in front to really protect him. Uh, you got to give Vegas some credit. They, they did some some nice breakout sort of adjustments to really take away the Dallas four check, which. Uh, or the previous couple of games really suffocated Vegas and made their transition game, which is when it's going good, one of the best in the NHL, really kind of, you know, stand pat. Um, but yeah, it just felt like when it got to be even 2 nothing, Noah, and, and I'm saying this from my perspective, it did already feel like just the way that that game was trending, that that was already going to be enough. And I, I know that sounds kind of weird to say that, but just yeah. it's not about the score sometimes. It's how you feel you got to that score. And yeah. how I feel like if you're a player on that Dallas bench, you were getting outworked and outmuscled in every facet of that game. And to be 2 nothing really felt more than that. And it ended up being a much bigger blow up. But your reactions to I, I want I'm curious to what you saw. The only two games I thought were comparable for Dallas was game two against Seattle, where they got their doors blown off and game three against Minnesota, where Minnesota won five one and was all over them. That's yep. what it felt like. It just felt like yeah. one of those rare nights where Dallas was, you know, not just necessarily outplayed a little bit. They were just I mean, they didn't look like they belonged on the same ice sheet. I mean, it wasn't even close. I will say fun caveat for those of you who are like me, who think that Jamie Ben looks like a psycho killer every time he's on the ice and can't stand the man. Uh, the Dallas stars did not win a single game in the conference final when he was in the lineup mm -hmm. and they won all of their games when he was not for the most part. Right? And it's, you know, is there something to that? Probably, mm -hmm. but is it all him? Probably not. You know what I mean? Right. Like, and it, you know, he's, he's under contract to what 2025, I believe. Um, and his cap hit is just untradeable. Same with Sagan, right? And I think Sagan's under contract till 26, if I'm recalling. You know, and he looked, I, I mean, Jamie Benn had a decent playoffs too. Like there's no sugar coating that, but Tyler Sagan is just one of the best like shot volume possession drivers in the game of hockey. Still, I know his role has, both of those guys' roles have really changed for Dallas in recent years, obviously, kind of but but Tyler Sagan does not shy away from getting to the gritty areas and putting pucks on net. No. I think I think people have this idea that he's a little bit soft, a little bit more skill based, not willing to kind of have that get up and go that he did when he was younger. I mean, he was a workhorse in the playoffs and was a very consistent force throughout much of the playoffs this season. Dallas still a great hockey team. Ran into a yeah. Vegas squad that I didn't think it. Um, I didn't think Vegas would handle them so quickly throughout the first portion of that series. Um, but credit yeah. Dallas. I mean, they had some pushback. They had some fight. But anytime you're down three nothing, you just you put your back against the wall with no exit and no escape. You know, and I, you know, right. you just don't give yourself margin for error. And credit Vegas, uh, second Stanley Cup final in six seasons as an organization. Yeah, pretty crazy, right? Uh, you almost wonder too of just the emotional energy was gone too after those first two games of coming back down three out to three two, right? You, you forget that. Yeah, there's the physical toll, but what about the emotional toll, right? Because 
you start to kind of believe you can come back at three, two. And then again, that's where you start to think things a little bit differently, right? Not just playing desperate, but okay. Like, like you mentioned, then the margin for error creeps in your head and maybe you're trying to make that one extra pass and maybe you're overthinking a defensive coverage. Mm-hmm. It, it's not easy, right? There's a reason why when you go down three, Oh, that, the numbers are what they are, right? That's almost impossible to come back from it. Um, and unfortunately, Vegas, again, being the team that needed to close it out, um, they were on a mission and they accomplished it in pretty convincing fashion. And I think, you know, for I, I watched till the end of that game, you got to credit, you know, the Stars fans that were left. They actually gave the team a pretty, you know, resounding standing ovation, you know, congratulating for still a heck of a great season. Again, make it to the cup final. Um, but yeah, holy cow. Um, not the prettiest yeah. way to go out, but Vegas just, they they felt like it was their time and they proved it. From what I remember that they mentioned statistically, I believe it's 42 teams have come back from 3 nothing to at least force a Game 7. Of course, only four have found their way past that Game 7 into the next round. So it kind of gives you an idea of the challenge that they face. Unlike the Celtics, of course, now 0 and 152 for all NBA yeah. teams trying to do the same thing. So, and, and I'm pretty sure that hockey stat you referenced, I don't think either one of those came in a conference final slash semi. Correct. They were yeah. all in the first two rounds. So, and one in the Stanley Cup final, right? Toronto, yeah, Toronto, yep. My back friend. in the back in the glory days, way back, yeah, ba- ba- back in Nixon, that while, yeah, yeah right. So, <laughs> in the 40s. Um, no, uh, you know, on the other side of that, though, um, I tell you what. This, uh, we talked about it last show. This was the closest four nothing sweep I have ever seen in sports. Just I mean, like, yeah. as a Carolina fan, how can you not be chapped to feel like you should have gotten at least one or two of those games? I mean, three, I mean, what was it, three of the four that ended up in overtime and two, all of them, right? Well, at least two. I can't remember if it was three, but all four of them, one goal contest. Three were in, the third one was a one nothing shutout, That's and right. then the fourth one was four seconds away from overtime. That's right. Chuck winner. Yeah. Yeah. So close enough. And it was Kachuk. So, I mean, par for the course, right? Um, Yes. (laughs) I mean, geez, what is it? Like, I, I don't think in both of our lifetimes, I don't think we will see another four, nothing finish to a series, especially in the game of hockey. That is that close. And that entertaining. Those were four hockey games that were must watch edge of your seat hockey games. I mean, it was such good hockey. It was low scoring pucks off the post desperation saves, crazy bounces, everything you look for in a playoff hockey game. You got four of them. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And that marathon, right? uh, What's 17 or 16 seconds away from a five overtime game. Six longest game in NHL history. Yeah. And, and to think, right. It was what ended up being what three, two, or is it two, one, three, two, two, three, two, two, I think three, two. And to to the to to maybe the new hockey fans, right, where they want more scoring and whatnot, the defensive clinic that both of those teams put on in game one to make those, you know, I, I don't want to call them safe plays, but the right puck management plays, right, where you're you're definitely trying to get the puck out of your zone, you're doing it efficiently, you're not making a bad read, and just it was a it was a game of chess, right? Yeah. And it was nobody budged. And the one time that it, you know, that it goes in, it's one failed clear and it's in the back of the net. Yeah. Right. And it's, that's the epitome of playoff hockey is how that little mistake. And it wasn't a egregious mistake. It was puck off a glass and it's held in turns into an opportunity in the, then a perfect shot again. Right. It still had to be yeah. a really well-placed shot across the body, you know, for a left-handed shot on the right side going essentially a, like way from where you're trying to shoot, there's still some skill on that. But my goodness, if you're Carolina, right, you, you just you you can't feel great because it's, you still lost in four straight, right? But as we talked about last week, this could have easily been two nothing Carolina. The way yeah. that things, you know, that the bounces rolled. So, heck of a series. We talked about how this had must watch TV all over it. Yeah. It still was. Still, I think as as hockey fans, we'd like to see it past four. Uh, but how about this? The incredible Florida Panther story continues, and holy cow! Uh, you know, imagine if that series would have went seven games. I mean, they all would have been one or two goal contests. Interestingly enough, the Florida Panthers only twice during that series scored three goals or more. Carolina only once, and Game Four they both scored. It was a four to three final. So that shows you how 
competitive and how much of a defensive juggernaut that series yeah. was. Um, you know, on the other side, of course, uh, Vegas, um, in fact, let's take a look. One, two, um, only two out of the six games did they score less than three goals and they had two in both of those. So kind of gives you an idea. Dallas on the other side of things only scored three goals or more in three of the six games. So, um, and then twice got shut out in game three and game six. So uh, it kind of gives you, gives you an idea of where they were at. You know, it's funny you mentioned the Florida Panthers and their journey. Um, I, I saw a funny quote uh, this past week and it really, again, epitomized what we've been talking about. We went from how is it that, the Boston Bruins lost to the Panthers in seven games to how was it that the Bruins beat the Panthers three times? Right. <laughs> you Seriously. know, like, I mean, uh, really uh, what, what an impressive team. I'm going to be honest with you, Nick. Um, I'm definitely pulling for Florida, regardless of who wins the Stanley cup final, both these franchises, it would be their first in franchise history. Um, only second appearance for both, uh, of course, Vegas back in 2018 against Washington, 1996 for Florida uh, against Colorado. I wasn't even born yet. So, um, sucks to suck. <laughs> KUE group. Um, right, right. <laughs> I tell you what, it, to see Florida go on this magical run, and I almost, in some senses, it, the only thing that I think could really hurt them is just the extra little bit of time off because Dallas pushed that pushed that series uh, an extra half a week. Other than that, hard to say Florida's not the favorite. I'm finally I'm finally with you. I'm finally in that mode of yes, I think they're the better team entering this matchup, even though of course they're gonna be on the road. But they've been a really good road team. That's the yeah. thing. Um and their style of play is perfect for road games, right? Um they're so good in the neutral zone. They're so good at their own breakouts and moving the puck up north and just making this just the subtle small plays, right? But that four check, right? Kachuk, Sam Bennett, and is it uh Luosterinen? Yeah. No. Is it on that top line? Okay, that's what I thought. Um they just know how to hold the puck in, right? Yeah. And it's just it's it's amazing to watch them possess it. And then you got Montour in the back end who's had a kind of a, a breakout playoff year. Um uh, and let's just say it this way, right? How about this? Has the state of Florida become a hockey hotbed? Because it already was in Tampa, right? Florida's finally getting the resurgence. Um, and I'm with you. I think Florida does have an edge in this series. Um, and like it, in this first game, I wouldn't be surprised if Vegas took it just because, again, they're still kind of in rhythm a bit. And being at home, yeah. And being at home. Uh, but you kind of think, okay, Florida will will get the rust off. They'll split, and then you go back to Florida 1-1. Holy cow. Um, I would love to see that building full um, and to be consistent there because for for the Panthers, man, for we talked about Arizona very at length last week, right, and rightfully so. But one thing we forget is that Florida, they've had a similar, shall we say, uh, not a concrete foundation themselves. That conversation is sort of kind of gone by the wayside with some new ownership and definitely a, you know, the more recent success. But at the same time, look at what Florida's done here with that ownership change with the, you know, Bill Zito and some of the more recent things that they've done. This team is a consistent playoff year uh, team, fourth year in a row president's trophy last year. Now a cup final appearance, um, you know, for that fan base, which has been, shall I say not a lot to cheer for yeah you know at least on a consistent basis I would be very happy for Florida to take the cup still wouldn't mind Vegas again I think I'm in the boat I'm not sure if you are that I'm happy that there are two teams in here that never won a cup that to me is fantastic yeah but I, I do think 30 yeah. years of of waiting yes. I think Florida's earned it Vegas has been in the playoffs five or six years multiple times in deep runs they'll probably be back next year um but yeah, it's I think be I just think as a wild fan, it just it would be tough to see Vegas win it just so early on in their franchise history. I think some people are kind of in that boat of like a lazy argument, if you ask me. But I don't know if it's a lazy argument, though, because, you know, if you're Minnesota, you saw the way the expansion draft was set up for Vegas and Seattle. Let's oh, yeah. not mistake the fact that they were primed and ready to be you know, playoff ready that. teams versus Minnesota. I think just Minnesota has the initial learn from the expansion of the wild and the blue jackets where they yeah. did it in tandem. Right. Um, they literally had an expansion draft 
with both teams in the same freaking building. And what's to say yeah. that the the game was obviously different back in 2000. It is now the talent pool much different, right? Um, so, and I think they realized too that even in a hot hockey market that was the Minnesota Wild, which they sold out for every game to what 2000 and was it eight or nine when they broke that initial sellout streak? Yeah, that you know you have to have. I don't want to say a little bit of an edge. The NHL at least wouldn't want me to say that, but you kind of do it that way because you want that team to be somewhat competitive. Seattle, a little bit different. They were sort of more of a traditional expansion team with some of those first year bumps of man, what a jump they made in year two. Yeah. Uh, but I think if you're if you're trying to earn new hockey fans, which is the whole idea behind the expansion, right? You have to have those teams be playoff ready slash exciting to watch very early on in their um in their franchise tenure or else it just it doesn't sell right Vegas right now, the golden Knights, um, I will tell you, have a foothold on the Vegas market, uh, just oh, yeah. to, to locals down there. They, it's not like they despise the Raiders, but they're a, they're a moved team, right? They're not their own, uh, Vegas, uh, does a really good job of community interaction as well. They're actually building more hockey rinks and the surrounding communities in Summerlin. And I can't remember the other city, but, Hockey's growing there again. It it had a history there, but at the end of the day, yeah. Now, you know, it, feel, now it feels like a no brainer. Why didn't we do this? No brainer, right? Ago? Um, but that's part of those expansion draft rules, which they did favor it. That's fine. Um, but Minnesota, that's it, whatever. Like you also couldn't capitalize. You missed on drafts. Like, come on, don't tell me about the the Colton Gillies and the James Shepard first round picks that were wild misses. Uh, how about Tyler Kuman, the defensive side, who I think only played a, one game in his NHL career yeah. before. Philip Johansson. Yeah. Philip Johansson, right? So I I get it, but I also like don't because you've also in your early years didn't draft very well. You didn't really ownership. I'm not trying to blame ownership here, but I just didn't get the feeling that when you had ample opportunities to maybe shake things up and maybe take a, a bigger swing, they didn't. And then when they do, they do it all at once. And now we're still feeling the effects of Suter and Parisi <laughs> even years yeah. later. So, you know, there's been some mismanagement there too. Let's put it on, let's put it that way. Minnesota wild attendance rate, uh, just under 102% this season. No surprise there. No surprise. Uh, Florida Vegas, uh, interestingly enough, besides the injury to Brassois, um, largely both these teams untested as far as the injury bug, this playoffs entering the Stanley Cup final two, which is kind of well, rare to, well, to talk about uh, in some senses. Reported injuries, right? Because you and I both know there's going to be players right now that yeah. are coming through stuff. Um, yeah, no we'll doubt. Hear, we'll hear about that at the end of the series, but... No doubt. Uh, game one starting uh, on TNT, TBS, C um, CBC, Sportsnet. Uh, that one is going to be Saturday, June 3rd at 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central. Game two is on Monday, same time uh, on CBC and Sportsnet. Game three, uh, not until Thursday. So each time they travel, they're getting three Jeez. days in between. So, um, so yeah, uh, all games are at 7 o'clock Central. Uh, going back to Florida, then Saturday again for game four. Game five, if necessary, is the following Tuesday. Game six, if needed, is Friday, June 16th. And then game seven, should it get to that point, would be Monday, June 19th. So a lot of spacing for the Stanley Cup final for these teams to rest and recuperate for travel. Uh, this series, uh, why don't we predict it before we move on to the next little topic here, Nick? I have the Florida Panthers in six. Oof. Panthers in seven. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on I, the I, road. I, yeah. Yeah, and just, I don't know, like, again, you can make an argument for both these teams to win the Cup, obviously, right? Yeah. Um, it just it feels similar, right? I think Vegas has a little bit more of the offensive edge. Florida is playing so good defensively. Again, Bobrovsky's just been on a whole other level since essentially game four of the opening round since Bos uh, against Boston. So it's like, you know, what's going to move? Who's going to blink first? That's really what it comes down to, and uh, usually in these types of situations, it's the defense that has that slight edge, at least, you know, what we've seen in years past. So, but again, we'll never know, but Florida Panthers, man, time to hunt. Let's go. 
Yeah, it'll be good. Uh, the Iowa Wild on the AHL side of things here, hiring their new coach, Brett McLean. Uh, of course, part of the Minnesota Wild organization for quite a while now. I believe this will be his eighth season with the organization. Um, uh, seventh, sorry. Um, one of Tim Army's assistants in Iowa for three seasons before being an assistant coach back in 2020. So he's been with the big club for a couple of years, kind of pretty much split right down the middle uh, for his tenure right now. Um, when he was in Iowa, they were 107, 71, and 37. Uh, Tim Army, who, of course, just left, finished with a 157, 115, and 45 record since 2018. So McLean is 44, uh, 18 seasons, over 1,000 games across seven leagues, 385 of those in the National Hockey League with Chicago, Colorado, and the aforementioned Florida Panthers. So 162 points to his credit. So, um, Really loved being an assistant coach. In fact, even got calls from Andrew Brunette a couple of years ago uh, and really liked being an assistant, but just felt like the move and the time was right for the 44-year-old right now, uh, meaning there also is a vacancy for the assistant coaching position up in the big club for the Minnesota Wild. But we talked about the void that was needed to be filled where Tim Army was all right at development, felt like he had a good foothold with that organization, but now at, at this point, I uh, really didn't have a whole lot of playoff success uh, to show for it down in Iowa. I, what do you think of the shakeup? This is interesting too, right? Because we talked about how another factor wasn't just necessary to playoff success. Because I think really, if you're Bill Guerin, right, and you're the big club, what you're lo- really looking for is how are my players developing, right? What's that process looking like? Yes, if I have... Uh, playoff success great i think that's more icing on the cake but i do get the sense that although armies develop some players i do feel like of some of their top prospects right with i think it's a ryan o'rourke and certainly marco rossi that they felt like it just wasn't to the level that they wanted so why brett mcclain right now besides his resume which is good but now you have a guy that's been with the big club again mm-hmm. we talk about the transition now in hockey we're the little club per se has to really try to mirror the big club. But more importantly, that is part of the development process. It makes perfect sense for me that Brett McLean gets this opportunity because he knows the systems, knows where he wants to be. And now it's what, how does he surround himself? Right. Yeah. So that's going to be the big question is now, how does he take what is ranked last season as the number one prospect pool in the entire NHL and try to take some of these top prospects who have, or this close, right. And try to get them over the hump to become NHLers and not just the bus, right? NHL back and, and forth. Like and, the w- and the way that that happens, too, of course, him as a player, he was a big penalty kill guy uh, going through his career. And uh, his quote talked about, he said, I, at some point, I'd like to put my ideas on the line and be a head coach. I always take pride in the little details of the game. I know the game pretty well, and hockey IQ was probably something I always took pride in and also playing that 200-foot game. Hopefully those things come across in my coaching. So it's going to be interesting to see how things shake out from an Iowa. Now on the Minnesota wild side of things here, uh, a lot of candidates. Uh, John Torchetti was mentioned as well, too. Uh, Phil Housley, of course. They're looking for someone who knows the defensive side of the game well. Phil Housley apparently did, but knew the offensive side on the back end uh, pretty darn well as well, too, for Phil Housley. Uh, Tony Granato, uh, former University of Wisconsin head coach as well, too. Uh, also talking about John Hines as well, too. Um, very close with Bill Guerin, so he could also be in the mix here. Um, so uh, Darby Hendrickson still with the organization as well as TJ Jindra as well, too, could simply elevate into that role as well. Of course, Darby Hendrickson feels like he's been in that organization for the wild since – forever um yeah. so uh any idea what minnesota is going to do on the assistant side here dean evison obviously you got to be able to take a punch if you're going to take this role for sure yeah especially <laughs> if you win a game um <laughs> i think really what it comes down to is because you talked about penalty kill and brett mcclain being you know maybe a special teams guy mm-hmm. you kind of wonder if they want somebody with some of that expertise because we saw the regular season they said it was fine which is fine and dandy, but again, it's all about this team is going to be judged by their postseason record, and that right. was atrocious, to put it that way, on both sides of the power play and the penalty kill. So you kind of wonder if maybe somebody with new ideas can maybe help with some of the pieces, a large amount of it coming back for the Wild, uh, can maybe better utilize that, especially towards playoff time, if they can get there again. Uh, but that, to me, is kind of where I look at it. Maybe some different offensive looks, right, because... Let's be fair. Here's here's 
with the Wild, right? They have one more year with Matt Zuccarello. He's going to be, what, 37? Is there somebody that can unlock something a little bit different? Whereas, I mean, if you're the Wild app, if we're a, a, a year plus from now, right? Zuccarello's 37 years old. He's coming up a five-year a five year contract. At some point, you've got to find a replacement for Kirill Kaprizov. Right. At some point, you have to, right? So is is there something stylistically or a different type of fork check or something like that that you can sort of maybe put in the hands where he, maybe he can play with a few other different bodies, say Matt Zuccarello goes down with injury, right? I don't know. That's that's kind of what I think. What, what's your thoughts? If, I have no idea. I, I There's just too many options, I think, for this club. I You know, like there's so many directions that they could go. Assistant coaches are – um, one of the few things that do kind of grow on trees a little bit at that level where you can kind of really try to tailor that here. Um, whatever it is, it's going to have to gel with Dean Evison's system. I think that's the biggest thing is that there can't be any friction between the coaching staff in that regard. Dean Evison, of course, prides himself on surrounding himself with guys that he's familiar with and trust. So you wonder if that input will come from him towards Bill Guerin in terms of the hiring process. But mm-hmm. um yeah, for sure. Minnesota, obviously trying to make sure like any team is shoring up special teams is obviously going to be important for them. So uh, the wild and Iowa, we're going to see um, really, we're not going to see the byproduct of McLean's work for the next two, maybe three years before we really start to feel the impact of what he's done down in Iowa. Should he remain there that long? Hopefully he does. It's a four year contract for him. So also um, serious than that, right. If you know, if Rossi can, yeah. well, that's assuming he makes it out of camp, right. Let's say he doesn't again. You know, can he take a guy that's got all the tools in the tool bag, but just can't put them together? And can he do it in a rapid succession? Right. So there's there's that opportunity potentially there if Rosie continues to be good, but not necessarily good enough to get to the big club. And you know, what about a guy like Kalen Addison too? Right. Uh, yeah. A lot of question marks surrounding some of these players that have got a big high ceiling, but just hasn't been able to reach it just yet. It's a tough job. I'll put it to you that way. It's a tough gig, especially when you've got the pressure um, and shall we say the limited resources too that the wild have, which tend to put a lot of pressure on the small club in that regard. Where's Brennan Manel when you need him? Uh, anyway, uh, ah. speaking of Marco Rossi, by the way, of course, playing uh, in the tournament uh, in the men's worlds and we did get to the medal round. We did have an answer. Um, I don't know if you're, if you're a USA fan, if you're necessarily going to like it, uh, but, but we had one. (laughs) Um, So going through the medal round, they did win their first game three, nothing against Czechia, Uh, Germany beating the Swiss three, one Canada beating Finland four to one and Latvia beating the Swedes uh, three to one. And what a tournament for Latvia. We're obviously going to get there, but uh, losing only four to two to Canada, which I would say is mighty impressive uh, considering how good Canada is Germany, the upset in overtime four to three against the U S I don't know, you know, Germany for how slow they started this tournament. We talked about it, how they lost their first three games, but you felt like there was something more. Uh, Well, they saved it for a a pretty good run at the end. Um, Bronze medal game. Uh, Latvia, the upset in overtime, 4-3 against the United States and Canada beating Germany 5-2 for gold. Um, I mean, where do you want to start? I, I think, first of all, uh, Latvia, one of the host teams, what yeah, a tournament yeah. for them. You know, I think as a U.S. fan, hard to even be mad. I, I think the frustration, obviously, you know, within the U.S. and themselves, but I mean, good for Latvia. This is exactly what we talked about in the international stage to see these types of teams make a push. Yeah. And uh, what's to say that arena was rocking too, yeah. you know, uh, in Riga. Um, yeah, I mean, that's when you have these smaller countries that just don't have the resources, the population, but they love the game, right? I mean, it's hockey's pretty big over there. Um, but they also have not really broken into, shall we say, that upper tier, right? And we're talking US, Sweden, Finland, Canada. I don't know if Germany's quite there yet, but those four for sure. Um, you know, to be able to put on that kind of a display on the international stage, yeah, they got, you know, a bronze medal out of it. And for us, you know, we look at that as, oh, okay, great. But for them, that's huge, right? Especially yeah. against the competition that they face year in and year out. Um, good for them. And like you mentioned, in front of your own fans too, that's exciting. That's almost winning the gold for them, honestly. Um, and you can't be happier for the game and, uh, you know, for that country that probably looks at it as, you know, a very big problem to be yeah. uh, a Latvian, right? So that's cool. 
Very and it's happy. not and it's not like it was one of those games where they were outshot by 20 and hanging on for dear life. Shots were 29 oh. 25 for the US. I mean it was it was a game. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Uh the previous game that Latvia had of course against Canada statistically as well too. Um shots were 36 22. Of course the Canadians kind of poured it on at the end there, but uh I mean still it's not like again they were you know, hanging on for dear life in those hockey games. I mean, it was a no. good back and forth effort. Uh, U.S. outshoots Germany 33-26 in that other game that they end up losing in overtime to go to the gold medal game. Kind of a tough one there. Um, you know, and, and I think we talked about the frustration too, is that, you know, the U.S. is a disappointing result because we're, we're kind of like Canada on the expectation that we're going to have a medal of some sort and a high-end medal. Um you know, the U.S. didn't play particularly bad. You know, I, the, no. the Germany, again, another team that has made a push on the international stage recently as well, too. Um, you know, and even that championship game, I mean, it's 2-2 after 2. You know, it ends up being 5-2 yeah. for Canada on that one. I mean, it's not like shots for 28-23 uh, for the Canadians. It's not like, again, that one was a cakewalk either. Um, all four of these teams, and it's cool to put Latvia in that category, all had really good tournaments. They all ended up being the top four teams of the tournament. Um, but what is it about the U S on the international stage, especially on the men's side, it seems like as of recent that they just regardless, I mean, a lot of NHLers obviously in the lineup this time around and just unfortunately same result, you know, and it, the, the pessimist, um, I won't mention a name because that name around our circles is synonymous with passion, pessimism, uh, <laughs> you know, exactly what I'm talking about. Um, at the end of it, you know, they would say, well, the best U.S. talent, the best Canada talent wasn't there. Okay, fine, right? But at the end of the day, too, when you're there and you have an opportunity, uh, again, a lot of NCHC flair on the defensive side of things, uh, Perunovic, Perbix, uh, Ronnie Adder was in there, Dylan Sandberg, right? There is a lot of flair there, a um, lot of good young talent. I think when you're in that upper tier, right, and you have those self-expectations, sometimes – is it just that you're just not playing loose? You're just you're you're kind of getting maybe inside your own heads in those situations. Because at the end of the day, the talent's there, and like you said, that the games were close. So what I think it ends up, and mind you, the game against uh, Germany, they're up two nothing early. The U.S. Yeah. had a two nothing lead, and and least, a late, and a late lead too, and a late lead. So yeah. it's you know, does it just you know, is there just something in the brain that says, okay, we got the lead now, we can put it on cruise control is there just missing this sort of you know killer instinct i don't know um it just seems like to me that there's always that you know that expectation comes with pressure and you kind of wonder that in, that internal pressure maybe sometimes gets in our own heads a bit that's the only thing i can really think of i'm curious to your thoughts on that well you look at even the canadian games but of course the u.s games too you know final 10 minutes final eight minutes final six minutes i mean those are pivotal moments that you kind of have to lock things down and we've seen this on the international stage where teams that you know normally in an nhl game or whatever it is or even a college game seem to kind of go away and be able to hang on teams don't roll over and die on the international stage for whatever reason when you're playing for uh, you know, God and country, so to speak, it's, yeah. you know, things get a little bit crazy. And, you know, I think one of the things too, is that the U S the expectation is they're going to be in the mix and, and to their credit, they were in the mix. They're a goal away from going to the gold medal game. They're a goal mm-hmm. away from winning bronze. So like I said, it's not like it was a monumental failure by any means, as much as we right. want to poke fun at it. Um, but when you're a team like Germany, who you're not in the mix every year, when you're a team like Latvia, where you're like, oh my gosh, this is how high the mountain goes. We're allowed yeah. to be up here kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, that's, you can't, you can't create that kind of desperation at times. Again, or no. going back to um, the World Cup of Hockey, Team North America, right? Back in 2016, all these young kids that everyone wrote them off and they were one goal away from moving on to that round. And they were one of the most electric teams to ever they were so fun to watch <laughs> grace the ice. Like you can't teach that kind of desperation. Sometimes again, we go back to uh, the NCHC frozen face off the CC tigers and everyone, you know, you know, talked about my miscue of words and talked about how cool it would be to see CC, you know, win the thing and punch their ticket to the NCAA is well, obviously was against St. Cloud. But again, this is similar to the Latvia situation. Yeah. I, even as a U.S. fan, how cool is this, you know, to yeah. see them, do these types of things. The U S obviously has to be a little bit stronger and find a little bit more magic. It seems like the U S their best international play 
actually comes with the world juniors most of the time is that yep. that's where you start to see a little bit of the magic and as you climb that ladder don't even start with the golden goal in 2010 in vancouver but uh about that um yeah, I mean, any kind of final thoughts you wanted to add? I mean, it was a great tournament, a fantastic so, hockey. And they were perfect in the in the preliminary round, right? Yeah. So it's, you know, again, like you said. Why have we heard that story before? Right. It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't feel great because you, you still don't medal and you feel like, again, you probably should have maybe done better. Yeah. But as you mentioned, it's one goal games, late leads given up, overtimes here and there. They're close games. It's not like they're being tossed out of the building like in some other tournaments we've seen right so and then <laughs> yeah. again you know if you want to give the pessimist the credit if team usa wants to assemble a lethal roster as similar as canada maybe it's a different story maybe it's not i don't know but again i think the bigger point is they played well had a good tournament yes they failed the medal but good for uh germany and good for latvia i mean you really do have to feel yeah. good because again hockey is growing man and you want that to continue these are the types of things that sort of have to happen it's what we call growing pains. And unfortunately we're the ones that are victim of the pain of that. But for them, again, that means more than just winning a hockey game to them. That's a lot of national pride associated mm-hmm. with those two countries in Germany and Latvia. So um, it's much bigger than a game to them. And that's what is kind of cool to see on that stage. And part of it too, with the U S and maybe Canada not having their strongest rosters, that's a good problem to have because it means that a lot of yeah. those guys are playing in the NHL playoffs and having success, you know, like that just yeah. kind of gives you an idea of where you're at in terms of talent level uh, in other realms related to the international stage but we move on to our local topics here in the granite city where we talk about st cloud state university and welcome into the extra i session nick max and noah grant episode 164 here in the den as we move closer and closer into june um i just realized as we went through it we did not talk about the ahl playoffs at all but maybe we'll save it for maybe the next show that we have we'll probably be in the calder cup final at that point so um i know we teased that for no particular reason uh welcome to the show this is the huskies warming house podcast uh so Ah. um you wonder what's going on with our show how about we ask what is actually going on at st cloud nick i'm gonna let you run with this one here a little bit here i because what is going on at st cloud i'm confused you're confused. Not really. What's but. happening? <laughs> well, like, so it was April, right? Where they announced what it was, was a dark and stormy night, right? Um, <laughs> the hurricane. No, I'm kidding. We're getting too emotional here. Um, but it does kind of feel like at least when the news broke in April, right there, where there was going to be some cuts made to ac- academic programs some faculties being laid off. And that was sort of expected, right? That was, you know, you could see the storm coming, right? And it's like, okay, this we can handle. Just 24 hours ago, in fact, maybe 48, Star Tribune posts an update that says these are actually going to be more cuts and there's going to be more academic programs going by the wayside. And I think that just raises the stakes a little bit, right? Knowing that as mm-hmm. it, it's no secret, right, that the university has been sort of in a backwards path since about 2010. Yeah, hemorrhaging money. No. Hemorrhaging money. Yeah. Um, Enrollment as high as 16,000, I believe, was in 2012 or 2011. Yeah. Now, hanging around 10. And pandemic more, was around 4,500. Yeah. Right. Um, and you just get the sense that when Robin Wacker took over this this university and, you know, she announced, you know, that a different initiative to sort of refocus things. I think at least as a student, right, we, we sort of knew what that meant. And, uh, you know, obviously the faculty probably knew it a little bit better, but uh, it's worse than we thought, essentially, is what we're getting to. Um, I think now close to 70 academic programs will eventually be eliminated. Um, it sounds like more than 100 faculty now may be losing their jobs in the next three years. Um, I think on top of that, too, uh, it sounds like the university is trying to launch some sort of for-profit online university for accelerated programs. And you know, there's a double-edged sword here because essentially universities banking on this system to make at least $10 million a year for the university by the year 2026. That's not a lot of time, Hmm. but here's the bigger question. No, and we talked about this just, just a little bit before pre-show. What if it doesn't, right? Because not only you're trying to cut things that maybe aren't making you money, you're trying to introduce new revenue streams. We know, and this is not just a St. Cloud problem. This is post-secondary 
education as a whole. They're just not getting the resources like they used to from the state, the federal levels. So I get it, right? I get it from a surface level. But this also reporting said that uh, the it's essentially alleging that Robin Wacker has not been forthcoming or uh, necessarily was very crystal clear in what this program or this new revitalization of St. Cloud was going to look like. And effectively, uh, some were alleging that maybe she had promised some people to keep their jobs and now they're not so sure. I don't know about that, but why does it tie into this, right? I think this is where mm-hmm. the ultimate question comes into play is that you've got a hockey team that is pretty good. You get a building that needs it's not so good, work. not so good. And more so it's, it's less about the amenities, right? I mean, their refrigeration system is overdue to be replaced yeah. and you need state funding to do that. We talked about this three, four months ago, was it? Yeah. Still on our uh, website, Huskies on website, podcast.com. Um, so about some of the, the proposed, uh, the construction stuff that's out there. Yeah. Um, and that's not a cheap deal. Right. And you got to go to the legislature. And even then that money is go, it goes to the university and then the, and then the, uh, the school essentially decides how to split it. Yeah. So even if you get the supposed funding, it's not necessarily going to go where maybe one might want, I think that's the, the proper way here why might want. I mean, this university needs so much more. Yeah. But let's go back to 2019, 2020, when the football program was cut, the golf team, the tennis programs, right? That was a big signal right there that something major is here, right? Now, granted, cutting football saved the university, what, 1.2 or 1.3 million? Almost per year. 2 million, Almost yeah. Two. But again, athletics is a, is, it's, it's kind of a complicated puzzle, though, because, yeah that attracts students. It attracts donor money. It's, I think nowadays sort of a, uh, if you want to call it a symbol or maybe even just sort of a level of the health of the university. And when you have programs being cut now academics and now athletic programs as a whole, first of all, what's been replaced women's soccer, men's soccer, I think. Yeah. What's your, I'm not taking anything away from these athletes, but they're not incredibly expensive programs to run let's yeah. put it that way so you're trying to essentially replace some of that interest right but it's just never going to be the same with football and uh others of that's of that like right the university's in trouble yeah and it sounds like even worse than we thought and thankfully they have a division one program and a wrestling program that is pretty good um well and that's that's just it right and i think what we think and and, and again this is my opinion and maybe none other but Imagine if St. Cloud's hockey team is not Division One. Yep. Are we already talking much worse outcomes here? And well, more so, how does this affect these Division One teams, the men's and women's hockey? Because at some point, it's it's a rock and a hard place. Well, and, and you and you it. and you mention the two hockey teams. We know which team it affects first. Of course, the women's. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, and it's just, and this is number one, why we talked about and Brian Idolsky working hard to turn this program around quickly. You, you got to go to the women's games like that. Yeah. First and foremost, like you have to, um, I mean, I don't want to say do your part, but I mean, kind of <laughs> a little bit. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day too, that doesn't solve the no, problem. No, I know. And you know, but I think it, it kind of puts into perspective a couple of arguments here and this, I mean, it's hockey related, but it, it's also not at the same time. Uh, the first argument I, I hear a lot of people talk about is why people are handing out scholarships or why they're, while they're enticing athletes to come to universities. Part of you mentioned, yes, the healthy university, but That's also, right. but also the fact of, athletes are some of your biggest generators for like you mentioned sponsorships for the actual teams, but then also filling up your classrooms, getting an education because Mm -hmm. what it helps universities do is, um, and obviously gives the athletes a place to play, but what are we seeing more and more of in today's generation? And this is not a bad thing. I don't discredit people for doing this for some people. It's the perfect Avenue. You go back 20 years. What was the route? If you wanted to get a job for most opportunities, you went to a college. Now people are going to trade schools. People are learning to create opportunities online. People are creating opportunities within their network. And it's either this idea of you have to get 
a four, five, six, seven year degree, or you don't go to college at all. There's no in between. So for a lot of people that the conversation was, oh, we'll just get your two years and get your generals in and see what you want to do with your life 20 years ago, at least go to college, at least start the process. Now for people who are on the fence, they have all these other options that are away from the collegiate realm that don't pull them into the university like it used to be. Like you mentioned, well, 16, 18,000 in enrollment back in 2012. Now you've got five, six empty dorm room campus buildings at that university. Yeah. And what's on top of that, like when you mentioned 20 years ago, right? The selling point for college was go here. This is the new GED essentially. Yes, yeah. you'll have some college debt, but you'll be able to pay it off. That isn't the case really anymore. We're talking about, yeah. you know, and this isn't to be political, but essentially people trying to cancel some federal student debt because that's been a hamper on a lot of po- uh, folks, tr- you know, thinking about going yeah. to school and and a double edged sword because yeah. the more that people try to alleviate debt, the more that colleges feel they have to charge because they're losing money, and it's just right. this perpetual cycle that you know nobody is winning right now, and it's nope. I, I don't it's it's nobody's fault. It's not like somebody woke up and suddenly, you know, and we talk about Robin Wacker, which say what you want about that situation, but it's not like suddenly she came in and suddenly everything is to the wolves. This has been a system that has been economically revolving in the United States for a long time. And we're seeing it more and more at these universities like St. Cloud who are struggling for funding or were kind of on the precipice to begin with, or had some trends that were moving that direction. I don't know what the answer here is, Nick, but it's not looking great because like you said, what if this online avenue doesn't work? What if what if the Huskies don't get state funding for their hockey rink and their chillers go out? And here's the thing, right? Yeah, when like, you've got a situation that is this dire as a university as a whole, the idea of fixing the college division one you know, arena doesn't seem so shall we say first need, right? Imperative, yeah. Right. And it's it's and I think that's what I see is the most dangerous argument here. And that is, let's say it does go out. You can't use the Mac. It just isn't an NCAA division one building. You yep. can't sell as many seats. So now you're back to square one. Where's my funding going to come from? It's not a great situation. In fact, we said it before it's, I think it's more dire than we really understand it. Um, being the fact that you're trying to replace revenue streams. Now, granted, if Wacker is trying to maybe cut some programs, I've got very little enrollment and that that's just sort of, you know, the numbers support it. These are tough decisions either way, right? Cause it's also taking away fal- faculty's jobs and everything else. There's a big ripple effect, right? So, but it's in the name of cost cutting, right? And at the end of the day, we go back to 2010. There was, there's been a lot of talk about how the university at, at its, I want to say it's peak, but when it had, shall we say a more big foot in the ground, right? where the dorms that they do have, they're very outdated. Um, A lot of the buildings there, you know, you just weren't being proactive uh, to sort of plan for the future then when you had some, maybe some muscle to go to the state and try to ask for some help to try to maybe do some renovations um, and, you know, things of that nature, right? Yeah, and it's not, you know, just to interject quickly, obviously, you know, I was only there for a year, but like not to be that guy, it's not a, pretty campus like it feels like a concrete kind of it's outdated like there's no other way uh, to put it i mean it's isn't and and that's the thing is some of the buildings fine but the dorms especially that's huge to the college experience in the eyes of a young person right part of it is the dorm experience they don't want to go to a university that is that outdated um and it's tough to, and, and granted, we can have the conversation about the city of St. Cloud and what it offers, what it doesn't, some of its you know challenges. I think those are well known. I'm not going to restate them now because at the end of the day, if you really dive into the statistics, every city has its challenges, right? Yeah. Um, but the university didn't help itself when 10 years ago, and this is hearsay, but from what we hear is that the, the president at the time was not say was not a huge athletic supporter. Yeah. Right. And you kind of wonder with that or, and, and maybe necessarily trying to use that instead of a springboard to bring more in to try to essentially say, no, athletics is not really the college experience. Either way, the university didn't look to its 
future, right? It just kind of felt like they've been sort of living in the moment and that's not necessarily the worst thing, but when you see these trends and it's, and it's not like these trends haven't been there for a while, right? Noah, uh, yeah. you kind of wonder when Robin Wacker took over, uh, I think she's been there now, what, three or four, maybe now five years, uh, somewhere in there that, I mean, she was brought in to write the ship and to her credit, I think the, at least the attitude on campus has changed. I think there's a generally positive vibe for the folks that are there. That's not withstanding that there are things that do need improvement, that there's things that have to change. And again, when it comes down to just money, it's easy to talk about it. It's hard to actually implement some of those changes, whether it's cuts or asking for more money. Yeah. Or, Laying a hundred staff. Off. Right, like that's a big undertaking, it's a huge undertaking, and I, I you know, you kind of wonder too. It's, it's that argument of is it the ch- is it the chicken or the egg, right? Is you know, you yeah, sure, slicing your expenses helps, but that also means you're not offering other th- programs that attract maybe a similar student base. Uh, maybe so, right? Maybe some of these uh, majors or whatnot were really that scarce, and maybe it really was time for that, right? It sucks, but you can't just even out the para, you know the parabolic curve, right? Because I'm not just interested in stopping the bleeding. How do we heal, right? What's the trend for up? And I think that's the biggest question you alluded to is what I mentioned is this online for-profit sort of avenue, a sort of a fast track approach is what it sounds like. Yeah. And it's being managed privately by like an equity firm. And these are situations which have in the past been sued. And I'm, I don't mean in the sense specifically one university or the other, but essentially it's been portrayed as not getting the value for what it claims to advertise, right? right? So this setup has, shall we say, not been well received. So, yeah. and so to me, you talk about desperate hockey players. This is a desperate move by the university. If, if, you, are, if you are this close to doing it like this to try to implement this because we need money. Okay, fine. But it just still pains me to know that there's, to me, there's just no way you didn't know that this type of Avenue has been not like it's been getting some bad marks from yeah. you know other places around the country. And you still feel like this is your best Avenue to create new, uh, to generate new revenue. Mm-hmm. That's scary to me because there's no guarantee in that one. And I get the big question mark we mentioned earlier. What if it doesn't? You know, they wanted to generate 10 million a year by 26. And if it does, there would be eventually a surplus by what 28, I think is what the Star Tribune quoted. Yeah. Uh, that's still five years away. Now, mind you, five years can come and go pretty quick, all things considered. But to yeah. me, the next five years could, c- can we put that this university is in life support? Yeah, it is. And I, you know, and I, you can't have another pandemic S type thing, anything like that. This university's done. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think maybe to close out the argument, uh, you know, and, and the show asking the realistic question, and I know obviously hockey, big ticket item. So that's going to be there till the very end, so to speak. Um, regardless, right. we asked the question of percentage wise. I know I ask you this question about the Arizona coyotes all the time realistically what percentage would you give in the next five, maybe 10 years that St. Cloud does not have a program in the NCHC based on the status of its university, like a legitimate Alabama Huntsville UAA a couple of years ago, honest question. I don't know if we're there yet because to me, the university and the, and the hockey team are tied at the hip. Yep. So I, to me, the only way that happens because again, we've talked about Miami and its struggles. It's still in the NCHC, right? Cause they're a massive university behind it though. Like, yeah, but yeah. at the end of the day, the Huskies have been competitive. They've been a top 10 team. They're still getting some dollars back. Right. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, to me, the NCHC wouldn't make a move. And mind you, you know, who do they have running the NCHC right now? Yeah. Right. It's then that person probably knows the situation inside and out. I think to me, the only way you would see a change is if the university is in essentially a, a no, like they have to do it. 
And that's and that's where I'm saying or where the university is in worst case scenario folding, for lack of a better term, or right. not able to keep its doors open. I mean, are we at a point where there is a, a a possibility of that potentially being something that happens if the cards don't fall in the right there direction is. on the poker poker I table think, here? I think you there know? is like you know, and unless unless something changes, right? And I get these are attempts to make that change. But again, it's it's about stopping the bleeding right now. It's not about trying to get into the the black ink per se, right? And so yeah. it's a multi-step process. Again, there's no guarantees. And again, when you, when we talk about could the university have taken better steps in the past to prevent this? Probably. The pandemic didn't help anybody. I want to be clear. That affected everybody. Yeah. But in a smaller state school setting, it definitely affects them a heck of a lot more. But you just you don't hear about this with like Minnesota State or Bemidji Right. Or UMD, right? And so that's why there's so much focus on this for me because they're all part of the same system, Minsky, right? And yeah. yet, so when I take a step back, and I think the big question I have is, don't tell me that this wasn't a trend that even the folks up top saw, right? Yeah. So whether it's university themselves or Minsky, they watch the statistics. Yeah. Why wasn't there more done? And maybe that's going to be a question Unfortunately, that will be asked if we get to DEFCON Delta, which unfortunately, as you as you asked, are we close? I think we're closer than we think. Well, and, and, and the idea, too, that this university, sometimes just based on natural growth, but sometimes of their own accord, they peaked in the early 2010s. Yep. And they were at this point where they felt like they needed to cater to that. And now suddenly they're losing out of that endeavor some of which was natural had to be done like you need sure. dorms for students to be able to be there there's nothing you can do about that right. but other things where you're creating when you have success you're creating programs you're creating opportunities you're creating jobs you're creating departments you're creating you know majors to be pursued suddenly you have to take that away suddenly you have to take athletics away you know it's it, i don't want to say the university overreach but i think they had this anticipation that the, the plentiful bounty was going to continue and suddenly you started to see the the, the cracks in in the structure and suddenly so in other words we're saying it's denial yeah in a, in like, a sense yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's you know and if that is indeed the truth and we'll probably never know right but that's or just horrible misstep if that's the case and uh, yeah i think we'll finish with this noah because i, I think at the end of the day why why are we talking about this right and i think the big thing is I'm an alum. You are, in a sense, you are as well. And this, the conversation that we've seen on social media and other places, it's tough to read. It yeah. really is because there are, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. There's a lot of focus on things that are, I think, beyond the university's control, such as a lot of people highlighting maybe the crime in St. Cloud, the city, right? Yeah, and how it's, that's it's, not, an, it's not one person or one group's issue. It's not it's, like, it, yeah. There's a general understanding or a general feeling of what St. Cloud is. And mm -hmm. you almost get the sense too that the university and the city of St. Cloud have always not had the most close relationship either. Yeah. You know, I don't know that to be a fact. Again, I've, I've interviewed Dave Kleiss, the mayor of St. Cloud a few different times and a couple of different, you know, non-related stories, but you know, it does kind of feel like they're two different sort of, well, senses, right? You, well, you mentioned it in the sense of, okay, let's say you're a college student, which both of us just graduated college, and I don't think we ever want to think about that ever again. But um, no. let, let's say that we are, and you're looking at schools around Minnesota. What's stopping you from liking the small town, modern campus of Bemidji? Or going up, heaven forbid, to hang out with Max Beach in Duluth, like, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, but you but you said, right? you look at those programs at St. Thomas, their brand new hockey arena, and unbelievable amount of money they have down there. Like, but also that's a private university, and that's yeah. also very expensive. Uh, right. I wouldn't put St. Thomas in the same conversation. No, sure, I, I get you're going with it, but yeah, you know. But also UMD, like Duluth, has its own separate problems too. Yeah, right. But it just it feels like. And maybe this is my interpretation. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong, but it just it gets the sense because I spent three years at Iowa State, right? Um, at the time that I was there, it was about 22 to 25,000 students. It was large, um, nowhere near the 43 plus thousand that it is now. 
but you've just got the sense that the city really embraced the university and yeah. was really supportive of it. You could get that sense when you were down there, right? It's, that a, there college, was, it's a college town. Yeah. And it's and there's pride to that too, right? I don't get that same attitude with St. Cloud. I yeah. don't. Um I agree. It just it kind of feels like, especially the 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 quote downtown, right? Where it's more about what the city wants and not necessarily embracing who their demographics really are around. And if their plan was to really separate it, they're pretty close to getting what they wish for, but maybe more separated than they wish for. Right. Um, again, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and claim it. And one with this, Noah, that we, I have the answers. I don't. And yeah. even then money doesn't solve this issue. It really doesn't. It just maybe eliminates a portion of the problem. But really, what needs to happen is if this if this university can sustain itself, again, you can't just be sustainable. You have to have a a, a graph that goes this. That's got to go up. And right now, it's not. So that's that's scary. And for uh, Brett Larson, the players, the previous coaching staffs, again, let's go back to Herb Brooks, who championed putting a, a Division One program in St. Cloud, right? back in the late eighties who essentially got that built, that building built that they're still in today. All of that hard work and dedication seems to be kind of going by the wayside. Yeah. And I think that's the most frustrating part is that we, we, we are so focused in the now that we forget sometimes that it took years, if not maybe more than a decade worth of work to get to where this is at now. Yeah. And you have to always be looking that far ahead. Cause if you don't, here we are. And there is a real danger here that St. Cloud State could be as a university in some even more troubled waters than maybe we think. And that's unfortunate. And yeah, if there's anything we can do, I would love to, but unfortunately it looks like there's going to be a lot more pain than there's going to be celebration to try to keep this university the way it is. Yeah. Well, I think I would close with just the idea too. And we've talked about this and this is, a, this is a legitimate St. Cloud problem that I, I can speak to a little bit personally, but I think just needs to be said here. It's one thing to be going through it. As the kids say, you got to be transparent. You have to be transparent in that process. If you're saying, you know what, we're looking at next year and there's 50 jobs that are on the line and that just is what it is. Listen, it, it sucks either way, but it's better to rip off the bandaid and be honest than try to dig the finger in the wound. Right. You know, like it, you just, you have to be transparent about that process. I think that's my hope. And I think you and I kind of talked about that pre-show is that reading through it, you could read between the lines and that's not necessary. Be transparent about what it is, because again, you have a lot more respect, you know, within your friend group, within a local group, within a state level, whatever it is, if you are honest about, we're wounded. This is our situation. We need help. We need to figure out a plan here instead of trying to mask it for what it is or isn't. Like you mentioned, Duluth has its own issues. Bemidji has its own issues. Maybe they mask it better than St. Cloud does. Maybe they are on the same boat. Maybe not. That uh, Highly potential. But there comes a time where you have to say, like, life alert, help, I've fallen, and I can't get up, right? Like, honestly. Cold red. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, Cardinal Red, if you want to be specific. But uh, I... Right. Um, you know, with that being said, hopefully there is a better answer. Hopefully there is a plan in place. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to be the answer. We are the Huskies Warming House podcast. Um, and usually I'm our topic. The team is there. So that way we keep <laughs> talking about it. I mean, honestly, like I yeah, know I, 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 I raise the alarm bells here, but in a, in a way, maybe we are where, because yeah. again, it's, it's not just St. Cloud. I mean, it's again, the people, right. I think about Brad Larson. I think about the players, yeah. you know, how does that, how does the universities and this news, right? This is the start well, of reporting this. Well, you know, the other thing too, is that like, you know, you think about, we always use Brett Larson as an example, partially because he's got great hair, but um, think That's about this, me, but <laughs> think about this. He turned down a job that arguably could have been his at a premier school at Wisconsin. Yeah. What if this team, five. what if this team isn't here in three years? Like, I know that's an accelerated timeline, but I think, just, his, just, I think his pedigree is, well no, I, I agree, but that, it's like, but. You, you talk about a guy that, uh, and again, I was willing to shave my head for it on MNCAA. I believed in the commitment and the process that he brought to the table here. There's thousands, oh, I shouldn't say thousands, but hundreds 
of Brett Larson's at that university, not with the prominent role of St. Cloud State men's hockey head coach, but teachers, support staff, administrative staff that do those same sorts of things, that have that sort of commitment. And partially, when you set up an organization and a program, you're honoring them and that dedication and that commitment. And it's like you'd hate to see that go to waste. Yep. Because of what's been going on. But again, like I mentioned, the last is warming house podcast. That's us. Normally we have usually really happy topics unless we're talking about the Arizona coyotes usually. Uh, (laughs) But with that being said, of course, a lot of great things to look forward to the Stanley cup final getting underway this week should be a really great series. You're not going to want to miss it. The AHL playoffs probably by the end of the week, potentially, or at least the start of next week will be into their final round as well too. So, and then a lot of player moves, of course, we keep an eye on in the NCAA as well. Also, To note another thing coming up probably in the next maybe month, month and a half like we normally do, I'm guessing we're going to transition into our NCHE previews on the men's side like we normally do. That's obviously been well received in the past couple of years. So uh, we're probably going to start taking a look at the NCHC and their programs and what we believe uh, heading into next season for all of those eight programs as well, too. So you won't want to miss it. Find us at huskieswarminghousepodcast.com or on Twitter at Warming House Den for Nick Maxson. I am Noah Grant, and episode 164, close the book, and we will see you soon in the net. One-timer coming, they score! Ripped in! A bomb from Perrix! No, Dana Rasmussen fires, and she scores! Dana Rasmussen for the Huskies, along. In for a chance to win it, he scores! Kirill the thrill is for real! Welcome to the NHL, a game winner. St. Cloud Cathedral is now 42.6 seconds away from wrapping up the school's first ever title.